Jill, whenever you're ready. Thank you everyone for standing by and welcome to our webinar entitled Fungal-like Disease Detection in Aquaculture Operations. This is a brand new webinar series called Freshwater Science that will highlight Ohio Sea Grant and partnering scientists every month. Every quarter is a different focus from human health and fish farming to harmful algal bloom and human decision making bringing applied research to the public on issues that affect our Lake Erie communities. I am Jill gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant Stone Laboratory, and joining me today is Dr. Vipa Puntamart from Bowling Green State University. Dr. Puntamart is a professor at Bowling Green with a strong interest and expertise in molecular techniques and bioinformatics analysis. She has a broad background in molecular biology of host pathogen interactions and her main research interests revolve around the molecular basis of host microbe interactions. Her work has important implications for future agriculture, agribusiness, and food security. And we're delighted to have her here today to discuss her research to detecting fungal-like pathogens in aquaculture operations. Before we get started, um, sorry, I seem to be getting a phone call. Before we get started, a few logistical mentions as we begin our webinar. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, at around 1220, I will conduct a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to pull up the chat feature anytime during the talk, and I will collect and pose your questions out to Dr. Punamart at the end of her presentation. As a reminder, this webinar has auto captioning and is being recorded to be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the half an hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delays, I would like to introduce Dr. Vipa Punamart from Bowling Green State University, who will present fungal-like disease detection in aquaculture operations. Dr. Punamart. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Jill and Christina for uh, the introduction. So the work that I am going to share with you today was funded by the Ohio Sea Grant. And I am grateful that they continue to support my current research as well. So <clears throat> I use the term fungal light disease because saprolegnia is not a fungus. It is an oomycete. It was classified as a fungus because if you look in this picture here, when you grow them, they look very similar to a fungus to the right, which was isolated from oyster mushroom. The one to the left here is the saprolegnia that we isolated in our lab. So, Uh, <clears throat> now, because of the advance in DNA technology, we use DNA sequence in combination with some little detail inside the organism to, to help us with taxonomy. And if you look at the tree of life in front of you here, you will see that the oomycetes and fungi are actually at the opposite side of the tree. In fact, the oomycetes are more similar to plants and the fungi are more similar to us humans. So I told you a little bit about those. One, they share some similarity, but they also have some distinctions between them. One of them is the zoospore. If you look at the picture in this corner to the right here, this is the electron microscope of sewer spore. It has two flagella, or you can, it looks like tails, right? So it has one long whiplash tail and one short that has tinsel. So when you see spore with tails of flagella like that, you can tell that they can swim. Now, this picture to the left here, 
we try to induce sewer spore production in the lab. So once they show this dark brown club shaped structure at the tip of the mycelium, we know that they have lots of sewer spore in there. And then you can expect between two and five hours later, they will release all these spores. So you see in the middle here, the club shape that is now empty because the sewer spore is being released. And I borrowed this video from Fresno Mycology Society to show you how many of them in just one sporangia. And you can see that they swim and they not swim in a random pattern. They go and looking for new hosts. They are looking for food. If they don't find food, they go to the resting stage and they can reemerge again as sewer spore. Now, I guess, uh, I hope you have learned enough what's the difference between saprolegnia and fungi. Then why, why do I care about saprolegnia? Because it actually amazingly has a lot of impacts on our life. First of all, it can cause a big problem in aquaculture, very much so in the egg or hatcheries. The picture to your left here, you see healthy salmon eggs. They look shiny and bright. If they have infection from saprolegnia, you see that some of them still have a little white mycelium in it of the saprolegnia. Some is already dead, some are dying. And if you zoom in, you will see this cotton-like structure growing on top of those eggs. And it can also infect brown trout, brow trout eggs to the right here and tilapia at the bottom. And <clears throat> the fry in the real, in the uh, another system of aquaculture, fry are very susceptible to saprolegnia. You look at this picture alone, you see that they can infect Atlantic salmon here to the left. To the right is a grass carp. You see that the fin and the tails are pretty damaged. And that bottom here, the whole body is also infected. And this one is from tilapia from Thailand. Now, this cotton-like structure, um, I think some of you might have seen this in, your, in the aquariums. In fact, I lost my whole fish tank, the aquarium, when I came back from vacation to a saprolegnia. And then we had one isolate for my own house to my, for my study. So they also cause problem in aquarium because they have such a wide host range. They also cause problem in natural ecosystems. You see that the left picture here is salmon in Canada and the right here is brown trout from Montana. So <clears throat> because of its impact is really uh, 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 important, we probably don't hear much in Ohio, but I can tell you it's coming. I do get email from uh, a hatchery owner or fish farm owner that asking for some, asking some question about this. Now in Europe, it's really, they really, uh, it's really have a big impact in their economy. They eat a lot of fish. They really have a lot of aquaculture for salmon and trout. And it was, it was so serious that the European Commission provided granted to a group of scientists at University of Aberdeen in Scotland to produce vaccine. Now, vaccine is something that you produce when that is a serious situation, right? You can sort of imagine, maybe it's hard to control, maybe you, they want to do some prevention so they don't lose too much. And they came up with the DNA vaccine and they tried Atlantic salmon. Salmon is one of the most susceptible species of fish to saprolegnia. So they found that it does help the fish to not get too sick, but it did not have any significant in terms of protect them from being infected. Think of us as those who had COVID-19 vaccine. If we had infection, we tend to have less uh, uh, sickness than the non-vaccinated vaccinated population, right? 
and this is similar re result here. So since it did not show any uh, the significant protection, I don't think they move on further to produce them. They are looking for new candidate to produce the vaccine. I hope I convinced you that saprolegna is quite serious. So before it caused problem, maybe we should find a way to find them early on, right? So my goal is to develop a kit or the detection methods that first ship, give quick results and simple to use by hatchery or uh, fish farm owners by themselves without the need of any equipment. So before I tell you what I plan to do, because this one is the first step that we did. It's not that there's no methods available for the de detection of saprolegnia. There are, but there are a lot of disadvantages of this method. And uh, <clears throat> first of all, you can grow them. You can make food, grow them uh, on a culture, but you need to know what they do look like. You need to know how to make all those media. The second, you can use PCR. Again, you require an equipment. And the third method is the qPCR or quantitative polymerase chain reaction. The PCR and qPCR use the same principle. So you basically make more of them so you can see them. The quantitative, you can put the number on, say how much are there in your sample. So the fourth method here, in fact, all the fourth four were developed in my lab with the main player, Dr. Shatoki Koch, or he, uh, he go by the nickname Joy. You can see how happy he is. So <clears throat> he had developed all these methods. And the fourth one is the lamp loop mediated isothermal amplification. It is called, we call it lamp. It's the same principle as, as PCR, but with slight different uh, uh, amplification strategy. The last one is called Sherlock or detector. This one is uh, <clears throat> the one that I would like to apply to my new method that we want to develop. And I will tell you in a minute what these are. So Dr. Joy first, he developed the qPCR method. Basically, we, we have it down to the picogram. If you have really tiny amount of DNA in your sample at the picogram level, we can find saprolegnia. You know the word nanotechnology, right? Nanogram is very tiny, but he actually was able to go down to the picogram level and we published this work last year with the support from the Ohio Sea Grant. So thank you. Now, the second, or actually it's the fourth one that he developed is the lamp. Lamp is even better because qPCR, you go down to picogram here, right? 10 picogram lamp, we could go down all the way to the femtogram that is teeny, teeny, tiny. The tube to the far right here is, has all the components that we have in all these eight tubes, except there is no DNA from saprolegnia in it. So that allow us to know that, okay, my reagent do not have any contamination. If you don't have DNA, you should look yellow, brownish like this, and we use it as negative control. Every time we do experiment, we always have to have uh, <clears throat> negative control. So we have the system in place. Now we want to put it in to work. We have been collaborated with Dr. David Strauss for a long time. And this time we again reached out to him and asked for some sample by the time our method was ready, he sort of said, perfect timing. I do have samples for you. And Dr. Strauss is, lo is uh, located at the National Aquaculture Research Center in Arkansas. And he sent us the fish sample 
that are sick. We think it was saprolegnia, right? We don't know because what we, what we see looks like saprolegnia. So he sent us healthy fish and fish that has infection. And it's hard to see because those cotton like structure that I told you earlier, it's hard to see because we pack it and mail it in the cooler, right? But you can still see a little bit that the scales are damaged here. And you start to see some hemorrhage around the gill, around here. So we took tissue samples from this area to, uh, uh, to conduct our test. Then Dr. Joyce, it was his good day again. When we did, we have tissue from healthy fish tissue here. Tilt number two, three, and four are sample from healthy fish. And we again, we have negative control. If you don't have saprolegnia, this, this is what you should look like. And we, this time we add positive control in tilt number five. Basically, is the same reagent, and then we add purified DNA from saprolegnia to show us that if you have saprolegnia, you should have this color. Okay? And sure enough, when we took those tissue that I showed you earlier, we see the color develop. And as I said, it's Dr. Joyce good day because he was worried that maybe the DNA from the fish can interfere with our uh, reaction, but it did not. So basically this confirmed that our kit will work to find saprolegnia. So I, I skipped one step before we came to this, uh, we, before we contact, contact Dr. Strauss, we also tested our lamp on all separate, uh, many different species of oomycete plant pathogen, crayfish pathogen, uh, other fish pathogen. So we test across oomycetes and fungi, and it's very specific to saprolegnia. Now, because we want to test again, you know, with the real sample, we reach out to our collaborator, Dr. Chris Good from Freshwater Institute in uh, West Virginia. He sent us water sample. We run some experiment he has a really good state-of-the-art recirculation aquaculture. So we test our kit from both the RAS and also the flow-through system. And we were very happy that the kit works again. The tank that show that there is saprolegnia in qPCR, in PCR, in culture, they also show up in lamp. So basically, remember I told you that there were five methods that can be used. The fifth one I'm still developing, but so we use all the four and they all confirm that yes, it is saprolegnia. Now, let me walk you back to what I would like to do, right? I would like to develop a kit that has all those capability that I show you in front of you here. It is not a new technology. It has been used to detect COVID-19 and it has also used to detect some other pathogen in food, but it hasn't been developed it at the point where, uh, let's say aquaculture owner can do it yourself. You still need to use some other equipment to help with those system. However, there are two systems that are being developed. It's called Sherlock. Sherlock is the same principle as detector to the right, except Sherlock is used to detect RNA. Therefore, you can imagine Sherlock is used to test uh, COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And detector is being used to detect DNA for example, salmonella, it, it has DNA genome. So those are just the different, but the principle is the same. Now, if you look at this picture to the left here, 
you see that detector, the one that I am going to apply to a saprolegnia, takes about 30 to 40 minutes to complete the reaction. In fact, our lamp, I did not tell you that it took, it takes about 30 minutes. We try to scale down. Can we see it at 20 minutes? Yes. But when you have very little, we need a longer time. That's why we said our lamp takes about 30 minutes to see the reaction. Now, detector take about 30 to 40 minutes. Sherlock takes about an hour. And the method that are recommended by CDC and WHO, this is about just COVID, takes about three hours, okay? In fact, the group of scientists that developed this technique, the Sherlock was developed by a, a group of scientists from MIT and Harvard. The detector was developed by Dr. Duna, who actually found uh, the founder of the, the technology and she was named uh, Fulbright scientist last year. And the Sherlock group just raised 80 million to develop this Sherlock system to detect all kinds of pathogens in human. So how about my own, uh, uh, <clears throat> my own method? Let's say if you send me a sample that has saprolegnia to the left here, it has saprolegnia DNA, and I mix them with my reagent that, contain, that has a bunch of stuff in here that I don't think I have time to go through that. But one of the major thing that inside my reaction here that will find out if you have saprolegnia or not is this little guy here. We call DNA probe. So the probe, we have, we have the color attached to each arm. One arm is green, one arm is red. If you have, if the DNA probe has both color on them, you won't see any color. We call quenching, they quench each other and you don't see the color which means that if saprolegnia DNA is in the system, this system is going to cut the probe and separate them apart. Once green is free, green is going to tell you, hey, I'm here. I found saprolegnia because uh, the, the reporter is free. So you look at it, you pro probably think about COVID test immediately, right? Or pregnancy test kit. So basically, if you load the sample into this S sample channel here, it will move up. And if you have saprolegnia, the reporter will show up and tell you that I'm here, okay? And if you don't have saprolegnia, you only have all the reagents. You want the, the probe uh, still intact. So you won't see the sample and we call it negative, okay? So now, if time and fun were still available, my ultimate final, final goal is that, well, if I have these tests that show up, you remember when you do the COVID test or any test, the lie here is not always the same. Sometimes very thin, sometimes it's thin, sometimes it's thick. So my idea is I hope I can find some uh, uh, software engineer who could help me to capture the picture of the band, transfer it into the smart technology because Dr. Joy already uh, have done the, the qPCR standard curve. We know exactly how much DNA is at what point. So we can take the picture of this test band, convert into pixel and compact combine to our uh, standard curve. And it will show up positive 100 nanogram, you need to do a treatment, okay? So this work is now being conducted by my new PhD, my new group, Sudan Passion here. He is a PhD student. He's leading the experiment with uh, an S, uh, with, doc, with Wasawan Mongkon. She is also helping with the project. And uh, do I have time to show this video, Jill? I think that's fine. Yeah, okay. that's fine. So this video show the prototype of the uh, uh, Sherlock 
BioSide, that is their vision. That's, that's how they raise $80 million. It's no audio, it's just picture. Oh, I think you would have to stop sharing and then reshare. Um, and there should be a little checkbox that says uh, share computer audio or share sound, probably in the top right corner. Uh, I don't, there is no sound, Jill, or Jen, or, or Christina. There's no sound. It just. Oh, so it's just a. Uh... You yeah. weren't expecting audio. Sorry, I misunderstood you. I said there is no audio. Sorry. All right, let, let's see. So basically, one thing you might want, you might notice is that they, they still need this device where they can change the temperature. But what I'm planning to do is there is no need for, for any device. So basically, you spit in this uh, uh, sort of funnel, it's going to go through. I hope it's still running. Yes. And there is a filter that will filtrate all the protein out. What comes down here at the end is the RNA from COVID-19. And you allow the reaction to take about an hour. So it can increase the color that you see from the lab here. And then this is, they are still developing it too. So basically, they capture it. And then it said, yes, positive. And you know, what is the pixel that show up? Then that's very similar to what I am planning to do. So, uh, okay. I think, I hope I convinced you that saprolegnia is quite important for the, our economic in aquaculture as well as ecosystem. I show you that we already one step into our final uh, product because we already have LAM and QPCR and PCR and culture and all those in place. We know how system work. The next step, we would like to further develop into this paper-based strip test and with the potential to transfer those bands, those tests into the smart technology. Now, I did not do much about what I'm sharing with you today. All the, all the works were done, almost all the work were done by my students. Dr. Dr. Shatoki Ghosh, Dr. Joy here, he is now a senior scientist at a biotechnology company in California dealing with human rare diseases. And Dr. Gayathri Belikala here, she is she had a really good job, but she is in the middle of changing jobs to find a, a something that fit her family better. Here is Sudan Passion, who is now going to give me the result from the detector system, as well as Wasamon. And Bailey, Bailey is our undergrad who helped with maintaining the, the culture of saprolegnia. I also would like our collabor to thank my collaborators, Dr. Chris Good from Freshwater Institute and Dr. Dave Strauss from uh, the National Aquaculture Research Center. And I would like to thank the Ohio State Grant as well as Bowling Green State University for their, uh, uh, to fund my research. And with that, I appreciate all your time and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we have gotten quite a few great questions during uh, Dr. Pundemart's presentation. So let me get started and ask as many as she can, as we can, what questions she can't answer today. We'll post later on the website with her answers. Um, first question is, um, does the disease have an impact on movement or activity of the fish? Is there a, any way to detect the symptoms without taking the fish sample to the lab, such as observing the unusual behavior of the fish? That is a great question because I am actually uh, communi in communication with an engineer who is trying to use underwater camera to look, to come up with the AI. They try to use the AI to detect that. 
Now, I personally, I, I can't answer that question yet, but we are trying to use new technology. You probably know we're gonna have a big Atlantic salmon farm in Ohio, right? So they try to develop this underwater system where if they can detect fish that has abnormal behavior, right now they, they're still training the, the, their uh, software to recognize the fish swimming pattern. And if they're swimming funny or it detects something unusual, there will be a gate. It's hard to explain, but they, they, they will swim, to a, swim through a small channel and the gate will go, you go that way, you go that way. If you're sick, you go to that tank. And that's, that's what they are trying to develop. And the short answer is, I can't tell you yet because I don't know. I don't have that answer. All right. Um, another question we have is, um, is it best to remove smaller Sagrilegnia colonies on a regular basis and risk stirring them up in the water column? Or is it better to allow them to colonize into thick mats that can be pumped out completely? I would monitor it very regularly. And in fact, when we did our research with Dr. Good at Freshwater Institute, you know, doing this kind of research is quite difficult because we can actually introduce pathogen in the system. It's gonna be health, health safety concern, right? You wanna make sure before you release the water from your experiment, it has to be completely clean or we create more problem. So when we did that experiment, we could not actually introduce any pathogen into the system. So based on the conversation with him, he said that even in some, uh, 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 in the control tank where we don't give any treatment, some tank do not have saprolegnia. But in the treatment tank, sometimes it's still there because if you allow organic matter to sit in the bottom of your system, that's where saprolegnia is gonna sit and wait until you, they see the fish that maybe they just swim and bump into each, each other and have a little scratch on their skin or the gill. They will start to produce all those million source for and swim and then attack the fish. Uh, before I end, I would like to also share with you that in fact, the mushroom, the big fish are not quite susceptible. The eggs are very susceptible. If you have just one dead egg in your tray, the whole tray is gonna be gone because it's just sitting there and waiting. It has chemotaxis. It can smell that, oh, there is food coming out from that dead egg. And the whole tray will be gone sometime within 36 hours. So, oh, so to, to answer the question, as you have an answer, is that I would regularly remove any in there because it otherwise it allowed a niche for them to colonize even in a larger amount. All right. Um, I have another question that this one um, is dealing more for a couple of them with uh, treatment. Um, what role does a veterinarian play in these detect detection methods? Any medications that are commonly used in the field for treatment or prevention of these algal outbreaks? Have we seen any antimicrobial resistance to these medication trends? So that's four questions in one, right? I know, I know, <laughs> sorry. So No, no, so one, what role the veterinarian play in this? I guess, uh, um, Saprolegnia is hard to, uh, to predict because they are actually, we can call it secondary or they are opportunistic, let's put it that way, like just like all human diseases. If you're healthy, we're not gonna get infection, but once our immune system drop, this opportunistic pattern will attack. And this is exactly what happened in the fish. So, external factor play roles in this, what you should do is to monitor the water temperature because Dr. Strauss can tell you that 
in the south, if they know the cold front is coming, they're actually going to have to start to do the, even the treatment before the cold front come or they watch the temperature. And uh, <clears throat> that's why I think my method will be very useful for, for fish farm owner because they can monitor it, even though they know the cold front is going to come. But if your pond has very low level, that there's no point to treat that pond, right? The one that has higher amount, they will have some implement or uh, intervention. Now, Dr. Strauss, I think he was almost the only one who studied saprolagnia. He is at the National Aquaculture Center. Before I reached out to him and said, I really interested in looking at this guy. So the vet, I think if you, if you know that the water temperature should drop, it's, it's too difficult that the vet can tell you that there is saprolegnia or not, because that's why I think my, my detection will be helpful. You can, you can actually tell before the fish was being attacked. You just, if you have some injured fish in the tank, you can just take them out and separate them if you can in a separate system. So that's one system, the role of the vet maybe monitor the environment that can be uh, suitable for sapolectomy. So what is the second question again, please? Oh, you're muted, Jill. Uh, what, uh, what is the preferred method for treatment? Okay. It's, it's hard for me to say, but I will tell you. So in the past, they used malachite green and it's banned. It, was, it has been banned because it also caused, you know, human health problem. It is a mutagen. So right now, as far as I know that they still use formalin to treat those regions like topical outside. So you actually take the fish out if it's the high value fish like koi or the fish that you use in the breeding system they usually take them out and actually get rid of saprolegnia. Basically, just pull them out and treat them with a uh, uh, cup. Sometimes they use copper sulfate. Now, I had a study, Dr. Joy did the study. If you have a chance, you can Google his name. And uh, he has a thesis that he has, Shatoki Ghosh here, Dr. Joy, the first person here. He, his thesis is about I don't know, 200 pages. He did some of the study of chemical control in saprolegnia. We did parasitic acid, which is the mix of acetic acid or vinegar with hydrogen peroxide. And uh, uh, they can use that to also treat or prevention of saprolegnia. For example, you know that, okay, the cold front is coming. Let's just use, they treat this parasitic acid the concentration and all those details. There are some publications out there as well as Dr. Joyce's uh, this dissertation that has those. So now if you have the smaller fish like that, it, it, it might be worthwhile to make a small, have a small tank where you can add parasitic acid because the good thing about parasitic acid is that when it degraded, it become acetic acid and water. So it's very eco-friendly system, uh, 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 chemical. I think it has been approved in many countries to be used to treat the fish. Did I answer all the questions? Yes, yes, yes. We have a, a couple more and what I'll do is I will send those to Dr. Punamart for her to answer those. Um, uh, cause there were just a few. Um, so I want to thank everyone, uh, for being on, uh, the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Punamart for your willingness to talk with us today about your pathogen detection research. It was really an excellent discussion. Also a thank you to Christina for her work organizing this webinar series. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature. Please take a few minutes to fill that out. This webinar series is sponsored by Ohio Sea Grant and will continue next month with Dr. Suzanne Gray, who will be talking about how harmful algal blooms affect walleye vision. The registration link is in the chat. 
Thank you again, Dr. Punamart. Fantastic presentation. And thank you to all the participants on this webinar. We hope that this was beneficial and hope that you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Dr. Punamart. Thank you.